Um, thank you to all of you for making this happen. I think it's a wonderful thing to do to uh, honor somebody like Dr. Walsh in this way. And also, uh, like I usually tell people uh, to hear somebody like Dr. Walsh talk, I think is a, a real rare and special treat. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to President Kilpatrick to introduce Dr. Walsh. It's a, it's a great privilege uh, for me to be here tonight to honor David and to introduce the lecture. Um, I wanna first start off by uh, adding my congratulations and appreciation to the Institute for Human Ecology uh, and their good work in co-sponsoring this event. And I also wanna especially thank all of uh, David's uh, former and current students for putting together this conference and for all the scholars who came from all over the world really to celebrate David and his work. I especially wanna uh, recognize David's wife, Gail, who I know is here tonight, and his daughter, Katie. Um, and I wanna recognize David's uh, long service to this university. Uh, David started as professor uh, here the year after I started as professor at NC State which was 40 years ago. So he's not quite at 40 years, but very nearly so. Uh, and just has had a really long and special career. And maybe the, the, the most uh, uh, impressive thing that I can say about him is the care with which he's uh, shown to all of his students. They all love him uh, because he really practices what he preaches. Um, the focus of David's work has always been, um, does our society have the moral resources to sustain itself? And David has done so uh, through a personalist approach to political philosophy. And in that regard, I think he's, he stands in a very long line of very eminent uh, political, political and otherwise philosophers like Dietrich von Hildebrand and Max Scheler and uh, Edmund Husserl, and even uh, Karl Wojtyla. Um, and I have a special uh, appreciation for David. Um, I was, uh, I shared with, uh, Ryan Anderson was out in the hall, and I was, I thought he was coming, but he had already been committed to the prayer breakfast over at the JP2 Shrine, but um, I was sharing with him, he said, how did you come to be here at Catholic University? And I said, well, I was kind of harassed into it by Carter Sneed at Notre Dame to apply for the job. And when I finally did apply and came, I just fell in love with the place. And it was largely because of people like David. Uh, and I thought to myself, I have to learn a little bit more about this place called Catholic University. So I read his books. Uh, I went and got um, the politics of the person as the politics of being. I got the priority of the person. And I read things like um, the person, each person, is prior to all else that is. I read things like, there's nothing higher in the universe of greater worth. And of course, all of this is true. But when you read it, uh, you begin to understand, as David says, it's a lived reality. And um, I think that's really what's missing in our society right now, is this lived reality that there is nothing more important than persons. And there is nothing more important than what God does, which is to know and to love. And because God loves, we're all very relational. And that's really, I think, the major contribution that David has made. So I'm very excited to hear what David has to say tonight, and I'm very proud and honored to be here with you tonight. So please, let's give a big hand for David and his lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Kilpatrick, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, I can't emphasize too much um, how personally pleased I am that you are our president. And emphasizing as, a, as your theme, uh, the theme of your presidency, the welcoming aspect for every person uh, on campus and who visits us. Um, 
I think that, that is our first priority as a community, a community of scholars. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I um, echo everything you're, you're, you're doing and saying. Um, and I want to also thank uh, my uh, co-conspirators uh, in uh, the Institute for Human Ecology, especially Brad Lewis and Joe Capizzi, uh, who put together uh, the genius idea that uh, we actually have enough uh, stuff here to do a program called Catholic Political Thought. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I've, I've, I've actually, you know, I've been here almost 40 years, and uh, I've very often had the kind of sense that, well, you know, I'm doing my work, and that's it. I keep coming in, and it's, it's a perfectly fine thing. I love the students. Uh, but it's been, in the last few years, especially since IHE got going, it's been great to have kind of a more robust uh, community of fellow thinkers and colleagues and scholars who are all moving in the same direction. Uh, not, you know, not just in my, my department, but also in uh, theology, philosophy, uh, and other fields. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why, <clears throat> even though in, in politics, uh, I'm a member of what's called the political theory section, which is the smallest section of the department, as it is in most American political science departments. Uh, but we actually have a big department of political theorists across the university. And so that's, uh, that's, that's been wonderful uh, to, to have a more active engagement in that. Uh, and uh, I, I want to especially thank uh, Thomas Holman, uh, whose idea uh, this uh, particular couple of days has been uh, to have a little conference and talk about things of common interest around the work uh, and to have this event. Uh, and uh, also the, uh, the other graduate students who are part of his team, uh, Sarah Dunford, president of the Graduate Student Association, and Corbin Kelly, uh, uh, a, an invaluable assist in the whole thing. Uh, and of course, naturally, all the sponsors and supporters uh, that have uh, shown in the, in the most important way po possible by ponying up some funds uh, to support it. <laughs> Nothing says I love you more than cash. <laughs> um, OK. <clears throat> My topic this evening, the topic of, the, of, of my lecture is person means relation. And I must have a little apology to um, um, uh, one of my former students, a very distinguished uh, dean down at the University of Dallas, uh, Philip Harold, who unfortunately heard this, this lecture about a month ago. Uh, they wanted me to give a talk on the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. And so I put this together. And the title, in fact, comes from St. Thomas. Um, there, uh, the, the, the little bit of the background is that there's a famous article by Joseph Ratzinger called uh, The Understanding of the Person in Theology. And he, goes, he does a lovely sort of survey of the idea of the person as, insofar as theology develops it. Uh, and uh, he does mention that St. Thomas uh, never really applies his notion of the person to human persons, uh, but that he works it out in relation to the persons in the Trinity, the Trinity of divine persons. Uh, and he sort of leaves it at that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when I got this invitation, uh, I, um, I thought, you know, I should really go back and look at those texts again. Uh, one of the joys of, of being in, in my job is that uh, I uh, uh, can relearn things every year. <laughs> things I thought I knew, um, I, I, it turns out I actually don't. So I'm really working for that really last class that I teach. They would get the very best. Uh, but everybody else is just sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm in training, basically, up to that point. Uh, and so I went back and re-looked re at, at those texts in St. Thomas on question 29 uh, of the first part of the Summa. And uh, I, I did recall that he had said person means relation. Uh, but um, uh, I hadn't realized the extent to which he actually does generalize it as a, an account of persons as such. 
and doesn't simply single it out or exclude it to divine persons. No, he doesn't build it out either, but it's well worth uh, looking at again to see what can we draw out from it and think, uh, you know, how does that, how does that work out? Um, my talk, essentially, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm uh, very mindful of keeping uh, on, on time, um, basically has four parts. Our first part uh, will be a, 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 a sort of more extended uh, discussion of uh, the idea of uh, person as relation uh, in St. Thomas, and that will be more straightforward. Um, and then we will move into the idea of inwardness, which is what really characterizes the idea of the person, that each person has an inside. Um, as I look around here, you're all here, but I know that inwardly you're, you're somehow a different world. You're a world unto yourselves, uh, and we carry a world inside of ourselves, and all of that. Uh, that's not in St. Thomas. Uh, so that's, that's something that has to be added to it. The relational aspect is there, but the inwardness isn't there. The uh, third part will be on uh, kind of a problem that Immanuel Kant had uh, when he um, uh, uh, thought about uh, how do persons stand in relation to history, which is something larger than persons and in which they be, seem to be a means towards an end. And we might call that third part persons as transcendence, the transcendence of persons. And the last one will be on the idea of mutuality, which is in many ways kind of the high, we return back to the idea of, of relation, it's mutuality as, as we might say, uh, two inwardnesses disclose themselves to one another. They know one another inwardly in mutuality. So that's kind of a, a rough guide. Uh, no need for a, a, a PowerPoint. Yeah. You can keep those four, four thoughts in your mind. <clears throat> okay. Person as relation. Even when Alcibiades ruptured the tranquility of the symposium and gave his drunken panegyric to the person of Socrates, we only catch a glimpse of the kind of impact he referenced. In other words, in, in the classical world, we do see that persons have an impact on one another, but they don't have a language that really identifies what's going on. It's, it's sort of oblique. The pain of that fractured relationship, portending the fracture of Athenian power, is displayed but never explicated. Inwardness is everywhere, including the call of inwardness that is refused, to such an extent that we seem to be on the brink of acknowledging the centrality of the impact of persons on one another, yet it recedes. The intensity of the personal touch, never more palpable than in a dialogue on love, the, the subject of the symposium, Plato's famous text on love is discreetly covered over behind layers of irony that seem to unfold endlessly. When Aristotle resumes his cooler discussion of philia, friendship, it is within the context of a work on character, ethics, that requires a sensitive reading to discern the personal and interpersonal depths that lie behind it. The friend may be what Aristotle calls another self, but what does it mean to have that capacity to live within one another? Only his own singular admission of synesthesis, uh, a, a reference for which I'm eternally grateful to my friend John von Hiking, who's here this evening, uh, which means joint perception. It's not a well-known term in, in, in Aristotle, but uh, John very nicely has, has, in a sense, made it available to us. Uh, opens the door to that very different vista from the work on self that is the main topic of the ethics. So in other words, uh, the classical thinkers, uh, they don't really use this, the term person at all, uh, but they're on the, on the border of it. Nowhere is there a hint of awareness that philosophy might require a very different path of reflection to follow out its implications. The time for the differentiation of the person had not yet come. Or we might say it was not opportune because the historical setting had not made, yet made it a, a imperative. Without a pressing necessity, prosopon, 
the, uh, the term from the Greek term from which we get person, uh, could remain a term of casual use for actors on the stage, rather than a technical term for what most defines us. Uh, it literally means the mask the Greek actors carried. It would not be until the church fathers had a problem of sufficient gravity that they would have to hammer out what it means to be a person. And we had a wonderful session just a while ago on all of that. Faith in three persons within the one God or the two natures within one person in Christ was that unmistakable necessity. The only problem was that once the immediate agency of dogmatic clarification had been surmounted, the wider implications of the no for the notion of the person especially its application to all persons, could again fall by the philosophical wayside. Perhaps there was no better indication of this postponement than the definition of the person mounted by Boethius, 480 to 524, and transmitted to the succeeding centuries. For it was just the kind of formula, quote, a person is a substance of a rational nature uh, that blocked the path to further development. Uh, that's quoted over and over again uh, for the next millennium. Gone was the opportunity for a richer and more supple understanding that might navigate what it means to be a person. Even Augustine's formidable exploration of interiority in the Confessions was not enough to spur further reflection. Uh, his own account of the Trinity would remain solidly within the boundary of a substance-driven metaphysics. Uh, that fell disappointingly short of the mutuality of persons. Faculty psychology was firmly on the, on the way to supplanting uh, a psychology of persons in their unboundedness. This was probably why the formula of Boethius prevailed with such solidity into the medieval period and beyond. A person is a substance of a rational nature became the outermost boundary of thought, even as its shortcomings as a paradigm were continually mounting. The deference of the medieval mind, fidelity to the reconciliation of sources that persist in their tension, uh, is amply on display in their struggles with the notion of the person. Not surprisingly, the work of the greatest medieval mind, the remarkable syn synthetic genius of Thomas Aquinas, epitomizes the strengths and weaknesses most clearly. While taking note of them, we should also remind ourselves that outside of the realm of, phil of philo philosophical and theological reflection, a flexible understanding of the person marched in unbroken continuity within the legal tradition that had always known its practical indispensability. We often think, oh no, it's philosophers that work it all out. No, uh, we work it out when we have to, when we go to law, uh, when we, you know, uh, get arrested, sue people, someone is responsible. Only persons are responsible for those things. Uh, as the unique barrier of responsibility before the law, the person could not be submerged in any form of generality. A nice article by John Finnis called The Priority of the Person summarizes that. Uh, each is a unique eye. <clears throat> for St. Thomas, however, the problem was not that the richness of legal practice Canadist or jurist had eluded him, but that he held steadfastly to the authoritative definition handed on to him. There, the formulation of Boethius had acquired an immovability he was loath to challenge. One wonders if this was a factor that deterred him from expanding his remarkably subtle analysis of persons, developed largely within his theology of the Trinity, uh, to a wider account of persons that might include all rational beings, Whatever the reason, it's fascinating to see him grapple with the, within, with the confines of a definition whose limitations became increasingly evident. Uh, it seems almost as if he's on the, on, the, on, the, on the border of a paradigm shift without actually undertaking it. Um, at any rate, uh, such shifts are rarely intended, but emerge as an incidental co consequence of a more deeply plumbing of the, of the confusions of history. Like most of the medieval monks, Thomas did not set out to change or conserve a tradition to build Christendom even, but only to find God. It was to understand who had called him that he took up the task of reflecting on what it means to be a person. Thus, it is almost by accident that he blurts out two of the most astonishing pronouncements concerning what it means to be a person. The first 
is that personhood is the reality of God. Quote, I answer that person signifies what is most perfect in nature, that is, a subsistent individual of a rational nature. Again, he goes back to uh, Boethius. Hence, since everything that is per perfect must be attributed to God, because his essence contains every perfection, uh, this name person is fittingly applied to God, not, however, as it is applied to creatures, but in a more excellent way. So personhood is really a divine quality preeminently. What is striking here is that being or subsistence is no longer the highest, but personhood is the apex of reality. However it is conceived, God is not simply the highest being, but person is the highest being. With all, um, uh, the highest being but is, the, is the highest. With all of the mysterious dynamic of self-giving, of love embedded in that term, substance suggests what endures in being, person, uh, what supports accidents, a suppositum, a person is always engaged in the communication of its being. Where substance preserves itself, a person pours itself out. The preeminence of God does not consist in self-subsistence, self but in self-giving. Already, the Boethian paradigm has begun to shift. For the accent is no longer on substance, but on what substance uh, does, perhaps even without limit. It is perhaps not too much of a stretch to suggest that it was Thomas's decision to begin with what it means to be a person, the person of God, that led him toward the unfolding of the trinity of persons that is God. Substance suggests what can be alone. Person indicates what cannot be except in relation to the other. This is the second and most daring idea that his meditation uncovers, especially once he begins with uh, personhood as the being of God. He asks whether the word person signifies relation. Thomas proceeds cautiously by invoking the Boethian definition in which distinct persons, distinct substances, uh, may or may not enter into relations with one another. But what about God? Relation in God cannot be an accident in a subject, but must be in the divine essence as subsisting. Quote, therefore, a divine person signifies a relation that is subsisting." End quote. To be God, the, to be God the Father, is not an accidental relationship, but who God is. Relations that for all others would be accidental to their substance are in God the essence of what it means to be God. It is in this way that Thomas deftly enlarges the meaning of personhood along a path of analogy that begins not with finite persons, but with infinite persons uh, as the model. It is only later, perhaps much later, after we have become fathers, that we catch a glimpse of that mysterious enlargement of who we are as earthly fathers. We have not acquired children. Rather, children have acquired us and reveal the unrenounceable truth of who we are. Of course, we may still be reading in more than the text can bear, but it's hard to resist the suggestion that this is what Thomas intends in his delicate dislodgment of the Boethian primacy of substance. Quote, thus it is true to say that the name person signifies relation directly and essence indirectly. Not, however, the relation as such, but as expressed by way of a hypo hypostasis, which means almost the same as substance. And thus, relation as such enters into the notion of the person indirectly. At that point, he seems to be generalizing. End quote. At that point, he seems to be generalizing beyond the application of the term relation to the persons of the Trinity, and seems to be claiming wider application to all persons. The word person came to suggest relation. He hints, quote, so that this word person means relation not only by use and custom, but also by force and signification. The transformation of Western and end quote. The transformation of Western metaphysics, for which Joseph Ratzinger called uh, in a famous in this, this famous essay in, in, um, in 1973, uh, where he says, uh, quote, talking about uh, Saint Augustine and the Church Fathers, he says, 
Quote, therein lies concealed a, revol a revolution in man's view of the world. The sole dominion of thinking in terms of substance is ended. Relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. Uh, it becomes possible to surmount what we would call objectifying thought, a new plane of being comes into view. Uh, those are very prescient words of, of Ratzinger in 1973, and his whole career is built on that observation as a theological personalist. I and mean, if you read through his, his, uh, his work uh, and his encyclicals too, you see, yes, John Paul uh, II was, was a philosophical personalist, and Benedict XVI was a theological personalist. Amazing kind of continuity. At any rate, uh, uh, that transformation seems to be on the horizon within Thomas's silent overturning of the paradigm of substance that ushers in a new paradigm of the person. Now we can talk a little about, maybe question and answer about, you know, what were the dangers and concerns and hesitations, everything that went into that. The difficulty that he and we have is that we lack a means of visualizing what it means to be a kind of being that gives its being away. What does it mean to put the other in place of the self? How is it possible to be selfless without a self? Nothing in the model of things that cling to their existence can furnish a similitude. We realize that a model of existence built on the enduring presence of things overlooks that which has always escaped merely finite presence. That is why Thomas's succinct remarks about the meaning of person within the Trinity are so momentous, even without his elaboration of their consequences for a philosophy of the person more broadly. Substance is no longer the model when it has been displaced by the primacy of the person. It is from the person that we draw a notion of substance that is no longer tied to its hold on being. That may be a leap too far for you, but uh, <laughs> Let's entertain it. <laughs> That's what we're here to do. Um, to be a person is to be like God, who could hold on to his being, but out of love continually dispenses it. We are the image of God, not in being a rational substance, but in being the substance that transcends itself. Instead of remaining at the level of an external definition, the application of genus and species to a world of things, we have reached the inner reality that sustains what the definition simply describes from the outside. If the person is the highest reality, then there is no model of it beyond the highest perfection of personhood. There is no way of understanding the higher in terms of the lower, for no matter how strongly material existence has a grip on us, it can never yield a path to what lies beyond it. The selfish gene can never explain the unselfish gene nor the mind that aims at understanding it. Person is a sui generis reality that has no exemplar but God. The end of a metaphysics of presence is palpable when it opens upon that which makes all presence possible. We do, of course, still lack a model of how it is possible to cling to being while continually transcending it. In the scale of all finite measurement, we cannot give of ourselves without dimin diminution but that is just the reality of all that is personal. By sharing knowledge, I do not possess less knowledge. By sharing myself, I do not uh, become less of a self. Aristotle glimpsed this when he tried to explain that the friend who expended his money on behalf of his friend gained more than the friend received. Only in a world of persons does it make sense to say that you become more by becoming less. That is the significance of Thomas's other great principle of the person as relation. It fixes, our minds, in our, it fixes in our minds how it is possible to be a person that, that continually pours itself out without loss, contrary to the logic of all imminent being. The reason why the person is the highest reality in being is that it continually surpasses mere being. It is in an utterly different mode of being that has no similitude beyond itself. There's no analog uh, in being to, to, what, to what a person is. The person is by way of self-giving. It is in the mode of non-being, so that nothing in being can assail it. 
It shares in the life of God. Self-giving is the life of God, and this is why there must be otherness in God. The trinity of persons in God is something we discern most clearly through the revelation that invites us to participate in the life of the trinity. But we recognize it as something that might, we might even be able to glimpse outside of that dispensation. It is in the logic of what it means to be a, be a person that loss is gain, an experience that overwhelms every young mother with the astonishment of being the first to discover it. Thomas provides a comparably striking formulation in his assertion that the, pers the word person signifies relation. Of course, for us human persons, we never manage to set, us to set aside our separate substances, but only glimpse it at, the boundary, at that boundary moment when our existence is wholly defined by the other. In his analysis of the Trinity, he was able to affirm the paradigm of relation as who they are. He quote, therefore, a divine person signifies a relation as subsisting. To grasp the full weight of that extraordinary statement, we must begin to appreciate the extent to which he has displaced the language of hypostasis, substance, in speaking of the Trinity. This may well have been the point where person as relation overturns the notion of person as substance. Or it may be more accurate to suggest that the model of substance has been surpassed by the model of person. That which gives itself away exceeds that which maintains itself in being. It is the more eminent reality that has no analog but the life of God that we see in the complete sharing of self within the persons of the Trinity. Nothing imminent or natural compares to it. One wonders whether Thomas's stunning admission that all he had written was, quote, straw, was not prompted by such a glimpse of the communion between the persons of the Trinity. Could it be that it was the inability to break free from the constraints of language of fixed substance, to really embrace the personalist revolution toward which his thought pointed that provoked this poignant admission? Not all mystics lapse into silence. Uh, many become even more valuable as they seek to make language convey what cannot be said. But that would be to fully embrace the discourse of persons who are more than they can say. The concision of scholastic distinctions hardly lent itself to such overflowing, even when its trace is palpably evident. To do so would have, uh, perhaps in, 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 in the hymns, he does it, and in the sermons. There are plenty of other traces in St. Thomas, uh, but just thinking about his more technical analysis. To do so would have required a fuller embrace of Thomas's other remarkable assertion that the person is the highest reality there is. If that is the case, then discourse about persons must remain consistent with its realization. It cannot remain an account of persons that excludes the one to whom it is addressed. We cannot have a language of persons that refers to them as things. Um, which has been one of the long-standing um, problems of what's known as personalism uh, as a philosophical movement, uh, that it slips back into thinking, well, persons are things, they're, they're like objects. Uh, person always means relation. Someone is utterly different from something. Okay. Uh, person as inwardness. A new opening of faith as interiority would have to simultaneously disclose the horizon of the person and displace essentialist modes of thought. The discovery of the person as the one who carries his or her existence, who exists in self-determination, is a largely modern differentiation. Self-responsibility, even as the way, res way responsibility towards others is configured, has always marked human life. What has not always been available is the linguistic means of saying it or of grasping the process of self-determination as what uniquely constitutes the person. Once again, we recall that this perspective remained within the realm of law where everything hinges on the inner intention of persons. Again. There are the pa parallel tracks here that you always have to remember. 
what is distinctive in the modern turn is that philosophy now explicitly embraces inwardness as its own starting point. That, this is why the interior perspective is so decisive, for it is in inwardness that each person takes possession of who they are and opens a process of self-disclosure and self-enactment toward others. The person who had for so long been casually identified with the mask, the term, now steps forward as its bearer. But of course, there is nothing to see beyond the self-presentation that has been made. Um, the person remains invisible even to themselves. Inwardness is an elusive medium. A far more radical willingness to dwell with the uncertainty of disclosure, to recognize it as indispensable to the sui generis reality of the person, is the only way to secure what can be secured in this inescapably fluid process. The person is in him or herself. Nothing can displace the one who addresses, nor the one who is addressed. They meet in the mutuality of what is over and above all that is said and done, in a manner that can neither be doubted nor deflected. Call and response endure without substitution. It is as the bearer of, res of responsibility that the person preeminently comes to light. The one who shares in that primordial freedom of self-creation has already stepped outside of time. Nothing finite can anchor those who have transcended all such limits. Yeah. They may not be able to give themselves as completely as the persons of the Trinity in their mutual transparency, but they can give the tokens that betoken mutual self-giving. When they get married, for instance, each can set itself aside for the sake of the other, uh, and in doing so, know one another as persons, that is, as bearers of inwardness. It is striking that the demand to abolish legal slavery really gets underway at the same time as this heightened awareness of the person within the Enlightenment. Uh, a lovely book by Hans Joas called The Sacredness of the Person uh, covers that. Um, Without requiring extended argument, it emerges in a, as a, in a visceral revulsion against something no longer tolerable. We cannot look on one another as things to be bought and sold with indifference, or with that minimal awareness that averts our eyes from the greatest crimes against humanity. Cruelty is impossible when we look on the face of the other as the face of inwardness. This does not, of course, mean that we have always lived up to the high demands of gazing on the other as other. Uh, but we have at least become aware of why it has become so difficult to kill him or her. A hefty dose of ideology has always been required to make us forget what we cannot so easily forget, and that too has not exactly been in short supply in our modern world. The power of the powerless, in Vaclav Havel's memorable phrase, has been the capacity of reminding us that each one is a unique center of responsibility in the whole universe. In the striking formulation of Immanuel Kant, in legislating for themselves, they legislate on behalf of all others. We don't usually read Kant in this way, but uh, uh, that's what I'm suggesting. You, know, you, don't, you don't always have to buy everything I'm suggesting. You know, I'm offering it. I'm offering it to you. <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, let me tur turn to part three, which is inwardness as transcendence. Uh, inwardness as the transcendence of existence. And, and one of the reasons I, I, I put this part in is because Kant also uh, uh, brings up this uh, intense problem that he has, uh, where uh, he carries forward this notion of self-determination, the person as uh, containing and holding themselves and offering themselves to others, and somehow as transcending and being outside of time, and yet also being within history. Uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you reconcile those perspectives? 
Despite the clarity Kant had, had gained on the, on the person as, as a, as a self-transcending, uh, uh, self transcending, he could not completely escape the suggestion that they still exist in the mode of substances within the world. It was the modern concept of history as an inexorable march of progress that forced him to see the jeopardy to which their readiness to sacrifice themselves had exposed them. To his credit, Kant did nothing to disguise or evade the jarring impact of this realization upon him. Uh, you know, my job is reading texts. And uh, reading texts, uh, our responsibility is to find in the texts those moments of kind of uh, deep self-insight that the author reveals. And this is one of those precious, precious texts. Um, as a child of the Enlightenment, he could not abandon the self-understanding of an age rooted in the progress of science and the increasingly rational unfolding of a world around him. But what would this mean for persons who could perceive and admire the advance of history precisely because they could never be completely subsumed within it? If each of them existed merely to play a part in a wider whole whose goal lay beyond them, what would become of the equally stringent requirement that they be regarded as ends in themselves and never as a mere means to something else? Kant's famous formulations about how we should regard persons as ends in themselves and never as mere means to something else. Well, if progress means anything, it means that every one of us is a means towards something else. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and Kant was deeply invested, the Enlightenment was deeply invested in this. Uh, the clash generated a, a shocking sense of disconcertment. The German word is befremdend, kind of a feeling of uneasiness, discomfiture. It's hard to give, get an exact uh, English thing. Discon disconcertment is probably the closest that we have, that he could neither shake nor suppress. You'll find this in his idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose. His conviction of the inextinguishable dignity of every single person saved him from the tendency toward instrumentalization, but he could not find a way of combining the movement of history with the transcendence of every person within it. The grip of the model of what maintains its hold on being was simply too strong to reach the model of that whose being consists in losing it. In the end, the only model of the person is Jesus Christ and those who find their substance on the far side of loss. Uh, but it's also important for us to find a way of thinking that through, having a philosophical way of articulating it. And that was where Kant, the greatest philosopher of the 18th century, uh, found himself coming up short and the man who discovered human dignity, in a sense, not the Imago Dei, but the, the, the modern emphasis on the dignity of all human persons. Kant is there at the forefront of it all. Uh, yet, uh, even he is stumped by this problem. It is by thinking through the logic of relation that a way may be found out of the conundrum that stopped Kant in his tracks. How is it possible to be a means that escapes the fate of being merely a means. How does one save one's life by saving it? The question has had a long historical unfolding without fully unpacking the, un unpacking the cryptic character of all that is contained within it. The paradigm of loss as gain can only be accessed in the reality of the person who has never been defined by gain or loss. Coming from before existence, the transcendence of it is already embedded in personhood. This is the complete self-giving toward, toward which Thomas's notion of, uh, pers of relation points. The person has never ceased to give itself away. It is what we continually look for in communication with one another, and know as the touchstone of all genuine meeting between persons. Have we said what cannot be said, yet must be said? Uh, in giving ourselves. It is what all, all great speakers succeed in doing, and even poor ones manage on occasion, when they say more than they were able to say. Run-of-the-mill homilists and professors 
take untold comfort in the knowledge that their listeners have shown up, not because they are the most scintillating of communicators, but simply because they are themselves. The chance to hear the message from a live person is always going to outweigh a canned PowerPoint. The excess that is there in any genuine meeting is the excess of persons who know one another as unique and singular persons existing nowhere but in themselves. The problem that stumped Kant was that he took a perspective on history that was outside of the persons whose actions constitute history. His conviction of the inextinguishable dignity of every single person saved him from the tendency toward instrumentalization, but he could not find a way of combining the progress of history with the transcendence of every person within it. That would entail recognition of the non-reducibility of every historical actor to their role within the historical process. Each would have to be seen as tied to an absolute utterly beyond the finitude of space-time boundaries. It would be necessary to fully embrace this principle that persons must be regarded as ends in themselves and never as a mere means to some other goal. He would have to admit that it was the objectifying view of history that suggested the instrumentalization of everyone within it. It was to Kant's credit that he admitted the shudder he felt at the prospect of dehumanization in that perspective. He knew enough to resist the totalitarian shadow that falls on all progressive narratives, but he could not find a way to recognize the condition of possibility for the historic, historiographic enterprise as such. A little reflection, however, discloses the artificiality of the external viewpoint of history as a series of spectacles, leading to the superior viewpoint of the historian in the present. Overlooked is the realization that the narrator's present will be overtaken by a future for whom he too will have become a past to be regarded as a mere stepping stone to the present. The illusion that each spectator within history possesses an unsurpassable viewpoint can only be broken if we recognize um, if, that the entire problem is only possible because we are never simply beings within history. Instrumentalization can only be glimpsed because we are always more than instruments. Kant's very problem is only a question. Uh, chat uh, GPT will never ask itself, am I just an artificial intelligence? Am I just instrumental? Am I just being used by students to, make, to turn in their papers? <laughs> uh, uh, all of those things. Um, reflection on the meaning of history. Uh, we, can, we can ask about history only because we are never simply reducible to our role within it. Reflection on the meaning of history is our transcendence of history. We can question the goal or the end of history because we, are always, we always already stand beyond it. The person is the apocalypse of history. We can set ourselves aside for the sake of knowing and measuring everything and everyone we encounter. The problem with grand historical narratives as they appear to sweep up even those who are enacting and remembering the process. A remedy is available if we recall that historiography turns on the non-inclusion of historiographers within its account. And lastly, uh, mutuality. Transcendence as mutuality. This idea of transcendence that we've been uh, mapping. Uh, so we've gone from uh, um, uh, uh, relation, inwardness, uh, and uh, uh, transcendence, and now to mutuality. Transcendence is what marks the person. Even when, that is, even when what is said is fairly modest, we can intuit the other who says more than what they say. We recognize the other, and in that mutual recognition, understanding breaks through. Each has made space for the other, and in that miracle of, communi in that, and in that miracle of communication, shared themselves. The case of Helen Keller's struggle to understand words is a great example of that openness to one another that underpins the possibility of language. For one thing that our teacher, Anne Sullivan, could not convey is that words 
point to something other than themselves. We can point, um, you'll, you'll get this in the story of my life by Helen Keller, ni Helen Keller, 1902, first published and continually in print. A lovely movie called The Miracle Worker. Uh, look it up on YouTube, uh, the, the water scene. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it, uh, but it's worth pondering. It's the most philosophical part of any movie I can think of. We can point to everything in the world, but we cannot point to pointing as such. It is the elementary practice by which mothers communicate with babies by engaging in repetitive and imitative games that seem to have no purpose until the smile of recognition breaks through. Uh, yes, it is a moment of insight, but it is more than a grasp of things shared between them. It is a flash of mutuality by which otherness overflows all that is said and done. It is with the heart, declared the, the little prince, that one sees rightly. This is the way of heart knowledge that exceeds all the information that has been, may have been conveyed. Aristotle, as I've said at the beginning, was the first to identify it as the high point of friendship, which he named uh, synesthesis or joint attention, where in being conscious of something, each of us is conscious of the other as also conscious of it. In this, uh, this is in uh, book nine of the ethics. Um, in this culminating moment of sharing, the individual awareness that each possesses is intensified. He explained that this was why we want to spend time with our friends, for it is the apex of our existence and of the existence of the other. By mutuality, we have become more than we would be in isolation. Some of the drama of that climactic eruption is vividly on display in the description that Helen Keller gives of the moment when she finally understood that W-A-T-E-R meant that cool liquid pouring over her hands as the well was being pumped. The, the eureka character of the event arises from the superabundance that overflows all. It is not just that she understood the word for water, but she understood words as such. The vastness of language and communication had opened for her in a way that finally liberated her from, that con from the confines of what she could only feel and touch in her immediate world. Um, she um, uh, had contracted a disease at a very early age uh, that left her uh, blind and deaf. And so communication was extremely difficult. And so it was only by touching things that she could uh, get anywhere in the world. So this was like a kind of supernova going off for, for her. Uh, 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 but it, but it's, um, it, it, it doesn't happen to her uh, by herself. It happens in company with another. Released from the limits of time and space, Helen had entered the world of persons, that is, the world of meaning. Wittgenstein made the same point in declaring that a private language is impossible. For words inextricably connect us to a world of interpersonal relations. The unique journey that Helen had to undertake after she was afflicted by blindness and deafness as an infant meant that the process had to follow a long and painful struggle. Her breakthrough was in the recognition of what signs and letters meant for someone else. It was in the sharing of awareness that the meaning of meaning becomes apparent. By knowing what it means for you, I, be, I begin to glimpse what it means for me. The epiphany of joint attention discloses the transcendence that is the reality of persons. Each set itself aside for the sake of including the other. As Helen Keller shows, it is the point at which words fail us, but it is what underpins the possibility of words, as well as the possibility of love, that vastly exceeds what they say. This is why we can understand one another across all the barriers that separate us. We do not even need to be beside one another for that leap of understanding to occur. It is enough that we know one another inwardly as mutual inwardnesses. Even non-verbally, and certainly non-discursively, the glimpse of otherness breaks through. Without saying, everything is said. All saying arises from the person who is prior to all that is conveyed. Yielding place to the other, the very basis of the possibility of joint attention, can only occur 
because it has already occurred in the transcendence of the person. It would never be possible for a person to give him or herself to sacrifice the self or die for another if that were not the possibility of the person from the beginning. This is surely what makes persons so difficult to plumb. Each is an unfathomable mode of being. Everything else we know is solidly in being, as a continuing entity, and strives mightily to retain its grip on existence. But the person carries existence far more lightly and seems less tightly wedded to it. Therein is the promise of love that each person carries, as the inwardness ever ready to include the inwardness of the other by setting itself aside. What kind of a being is so indifferent to being that it can yield place at so slight an invitation? What has happened to the putative struggle for survival that biology and politics have lectured us about? Even the question itself suggests its own overturning, for it gives priority to truth over mere worldly satisfaction. But that still does not furnish us with a paradigm by which we might grasp the nature of persons who seem to continually set aside all purely naturalistic drives. The transcendence of persons may be elusive, but it is not subjective. Nothing is more real than the persons we know, even if they cannot be subsumed within the external aspects of their lives. We know them in themselves, not in what is visible about them. This is the source of their priority. They are not what they present to us. Even the face is not the other, although it is in the face that we gaze upon him or her. Like the mask uh, of, the, of the actor in Greek drama, the visible sign is only temporary, for the actor will assume other roles and present other sides to us. But the one who, possess, who presents endures invisibly. Even when the character dies in the action, the one who portrays it does not. There is something of that inextinguishability about the person, and mystery remains. Even a world that does not handle the notion of mystery very well, a world that wants to measure all that is, cannot shake this primary experience of immeasurability of, that is each person we know. To name it transcendence may suggest a trail of ineffability. But that is hardly how we encounter the persons who matter most to us. They are the most definable reality of our lives. We know each other as a whole world in themselves. Far from relating on the surface level, they call forth a response that exceeds all else that is. It is in giving and receiving one another that we realize that persons are utterly beyond the finite boundaries within which they appear to us. We do not live in space and time with all the chronometers we apply to those dimensions, but within a whole other order of being measured in personal giving. It can only be accessed by the opening that is unconditional. Love is stronger than death. We cannot love a, per a person only in part, or for a while, or up to a certain limit. Who, who each one is can only be seen in light of the transcendence that each is and in the transcendence that each calls forth in me. The language of substance must be replaced by the language of relation. Therein lies the paradox of the person, for in giving ourselves, we gain more than we have lost. It is the peculiarity of the person, of that which is spiritual, that it does not live by the laws of material existence. Transcendence is the reality of persons. They do not lose themselves in surrendering themselves. It can seem that the characterization as pure, of the person as pure relation undercuts the possibility of continuing identity by which the renunciation of self takes place. But that is always to assimilate persons to the world of objects. Instead, we must be prepared to think more deeply about the challenge that persons pose for our solidly material model of life. Nothing in the law of the jungle, the struggle for survival, prepare us for the unbidden acts of generosity that's, uh, that astonish us. Giving without calculation or return seems not to fit the zero-sum reality of, of kill or be killed. Yet people do throw themselves in front of a bus to save a stranger. 
They do not choose death, but put themselves in place of the other. We say they have sacrificed themselves, but that is only to sidestep the mystery. How do they do it? How do they undertake an action that will certainly result in their death? Nothing provides a model except the astonishing reality of persons. We realize that they were never simply present in that substantial identity by which we knew them familiarly. Having beheld it, they transcended it. In this way, they could give their lives for another, even at the cost of their own. It was not that they one day entered into another mode of being, uh, we call self-transcendence, but that they already lived within it right up to the moment when they disclosed it to themselves and to us. The substance that can give its substance away has long departed from the world for which survival at, all cost, at any cost is the measure. Thank you very much. By all means, take your best shots. <laughs> Feel free. Any questions? We don't have any any official response here, but uh, we'll take a, maybe a couple of questions. I know we have something else going on. Yeah, speed. Yeah. So uh, it seems like a lot of your uh, work on Distinguishing persons from the rest of being, the rest of creation. Yeah. Distinguishing persons yeah. as a special yeah. uh, kind of being, yeah. Yeah. right? Or a person yeah. who's beyond being. Um, I wonder about sort of going back from, you know, okay, if God is a person responsible yeah. for all of creation, yeah. then how does all of creation in some way maybe bear marks of that personhood? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just playing around with a couple ideas. I'm thinking yeah. too about how uh, we as persons interpret non-personal realities in a personal way, perhaps. Uh, an example might be like a pet, yeah. right? Where yeah. a pet presumably yeah. is not a person, yeah. and yet we will treat a pet as if it's a person and yeah. we will miss it yeah. as if it's a person after yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Um, and then that also leads me to think, you know, along, you know, in response to some of the things you were just saying towards the end, um, that we do perhaps see, well, some people will argue anyways, yeah. that we see acts of altruism in nature, or at least we'll see like a mother uh, perhaps sacrifice for her young or something like yeah. that. And so yeah. I, I wonder how you uh, look at those things from the perspective yeah. of your, your account of the person. Yeah, no, sure. That, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, in some way, uh, uh, all of nature is, is moving towards personhood. Uh, I wouldn't say that, that, that per I mean, obviously, uh, personhood is preeminently a divine thing. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a goal towards which everything is moving. It's the disclosure, everything. Uh, Norris Clark has a wonderful book uh, called uh, Person and Being. It's, it's a wonderful study of Aquinas in which, in which he interprets Aquinas' as metaphysics as uh, every, every being seeks to communicate itself. So, right there. Um, that's a kind of universalization of the idea. Um, and, and obviously, um, animals, and especially uh, domestic animals, um, that you know, get close to us, are, you know, we interpret them as persons, and they read us almost. Uh, this is why dogs are so um, effective. Um, you know, they've, they've bec they've, they're able to read us. So, so we say, oh, yes, of course. Um, there you are. Uh, uh, bear or Spot or Pippi or whatever it is <laughs> your dog is. Yes, yes, we name them. You know, you don't name your cows like that. Uh, and, you know, wild animals we don't name. But the domestic animals we do. So we, you know, that's, that's really a quintessential personal relationship. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, I, I was just looking again at the, the Banshees of Inner Shearing uh, last night, uh, night before last, hoping they were going to win, you know, big in the Oscars, naturally, you know. Uh, but um, well, and it's, it's all about um, this, you know, uh, really bitter conflict between two old friends. And uh, they, you know, really almost go to war. And it's, it's in relation to the Civil War in Ireland in 1922. And uh, the, the very last scene of um, um, the, the movie is where um, um, uh, Colin Farrell lifts up the dog of um, uh, Brendan Gleeson, the column character, and gives, him, gives it back to him. He says, thanks for looking after my dog. They've, they've gone to war with one another, but you know they can bond over the idea of the dog. You know, uh, yes, yes. There is a sense in which you know uh, animals even can 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 create that sort of reality uh, in our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter. Yeah, David. Uh, you know, you talked about uh, persons as relations and as Transcendent yeah. spirituality. Yeah. And I, I wonder if you could comment. It seems to me that sort of a prerequisite for personhood. Uh, uh, prerequisite for personhood yeah. is receptivity. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's yeah. it's very hard for us to be persons yeah. right. if we don't receive who we are. Yeah. And so I wonder if you might comment on where that fits in 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 your talk. Person Certainly in relation. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Personal as a gift, you mean, itself? Yeah, well, you and can't be openness. a gift unless you receive the gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it, it fits into um, uh, inwardness, most of all. Um, that uh, the whole, uh, uh, and that's kind of the big, you know, all of the, this, this, this talk is essentially about the, uh, it's not that we haven't always been persons and haven't been aware of these things forever, uh, but we haven't really had a language that uh, kind of specifies what it's about. And that makes a big difference. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, when, when, um, uh, when you see something like uh, the almost uh, universal uh, abolition of slavery in, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's still going on. Human trafficking is still going on. But in terms of a, of a legally possible kind of uh, operation, uh, you realize that, no, things have shifted, and uh, something has happened. And one of the things that, that happens is that, yes, a whole society becomes more aware of how every single person carries that inwardness. And we so we're, we're, uh, they give themselves to us, and we receive them. Uh, mutual inwardnesses. Um, uh, there's a wonderful line in the German poet uh, Rainer Rilke, where he says, uh, two, where he talks about peop two people being in love. He says, two solitudes uh, guard and bound and greet each other." <laughs> it's just a wonderful image of that idea that yes, they each they contain one another, uh, and that's of course the the high point of every, that's, that's what relation really means. Uh, there's no relation. And one of the problems you see of, of, of St. Thomas's analysis, the limits of St. Thomas's analysis, that we get to see it kind of externally. There, yeah, there's a relationship. Yeah, you can see those people going out with one another. But what's it like for them? <laughs> what, what's it like to be a friend? What's it like to know that person? You know, that's, that's the, the issue. And so you only have a kind of analysis of, and even Aristotle's analysis of friendship is sort of limited, uh, except for these few absolutely uh, intriguing and fascinating remarks uh, in which he talks about them having joint attention. And we want to spend time with our friends. And we think, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, why? Okay, let's explain it, you know, let's articulate it. And that's what the philosophical articulation really is. Uh, and that's really all that I'm suggesting here, that uh, there's a whole ro ro role for this. And obviously, uh, then we create a political order that, in a sense, recognizes that, that each single person is an inexhaustible source of that inwardness, a center of the universe. And uh, we recognize it legally, 
and human rights are built on that very notion. Uh, we, there's, 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 a, there's a practice of human rights re acknowledgement and recognition before we even have uh, a philosophic justification for it. And that's what, that was what the, the framers of the UN Universal Declaration said at the end of it. You know, we agree on these rights and the rights and dignity. We can't exactly say why. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to do, is to, in a sense, give it that, um, uh, that sort of um, uh, um, transparency more than anything else. And that's, that's my job as a political theorist. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Oh, right. Barry. I, I got the you mic. Got, you got the mic. You're, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're a, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You paid for it, right, Barry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the first time I, I heard you uh, give a version of this was when you gave the McNish lectures in in Calgary, and you were working on your uh, philosophical revolutions book, and I was yeah. I was shocked uh, at what you were saying. Um, <laughs> and it's since become um, I would say much more. Your argument has become much more elaborate, much clearer. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things I've—I don't think I've, we've ever discussed this, uh, but this is a public forum, so you know this is a good time because there's the yeah. the theatrical part of it. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. is Embarrass important. me as much as possible, Barry, yeah. by all means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it my sort of version of this w would be taken from uh, from Fackenheim's. Uh, metaphysics and historicity, yeah, yeah. and and he took his argument between ontology and what he called me ontology from Schelling, yeah. and listening to you tonight, I, it, it occurred to me that there's a, a huge amount of overlap there, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it's a philological question, I guess. Yeah. Is has this uh, influenced your your thinking in the last uh, ten or twelve years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, the, the work I did on um, uh, modern philosophy um, is essentially uh, that background. And one of the reasons why, uh, in a sense, I'm more um, uh, more of a risk taker and more uh, audacious, if not arrogant, uh, in this formulation, uh, and all my uh, all my friends say, "Well, what about substance? You can't. You can't what about you? What about you? You'll disappear if you if you define persons purely as relation. Uh, you know all of that. Uh, there's no. There's no. There'll be nothing left. That kind of argument. And uh, you know, um, uh, Carol Wotia, uh, also uh, John Paul II, uh, uh, he, who was a great philosopher as well as a great poet and uh, pope and saint. Um, he has very few followers." within the church because they think, oh, no, that's a slippery slope. And once you go down that road, the personality just dissolves. There's nothing there. Deep down, there's no core. There's nothing. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm maybe ask, answering a slightly different question, but I think for the sake of broadening it out slightly, other than the philological aspect, um, I think the philological, it's more than philological, I think that this is really a kind of um, issue that requires uh, a more extended philosophical um, pathway. And that was basically what I followed. And I think uh, the German idealist stuff is, is really the way to go through that. Uh, because, um, and I think, I think uh, uh, Wotia and, and the people who, who are called personalists generally kind of um, hold themselves back from fully embracing it for exactly that reason. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of where I am. Um, I'm, I'm out there on that limb, uh, and I'm sawing. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping for the best. <laughs> give, give him that back in. Yeah, Barry's never going to shut up in this way. No, I, no, I'm going <laughs> to shut up in a minute. Uh, at the end of, of uh, Fagnheim's book, he uh, this just occurred to me when you went with what you just said. Yeah. Uh, there's a kind of he says, and he, I forget it's he yeah. quoted an English poet. Yeah. And he said there's uh, basically there's a kind of equivalence yeah. in philosophy of substance and philosophy uh, of historicity. Yeah. yeah. And that uh, that is your next job. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think I've already made it in many ways here. <laughs> question down here. Um, my question arises from the dog, and uh, yeah. but a little shift on it. Uh, the person has apex. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does that not possibly give rise to us becoming dominant, uh, give rise to the kings, uh, give rise to um, our domination on all of nature, all of things, and it not having any value in itself? Uh, of course, I'm a tree, but I have no value unless you designate that value. I'm a slave today, perhaps not a slave tomorrow. Who says? Um, I only use the term apex, though, in relation to sort of um, uh, uh, in, in, in relation to how we would think of the highest way of, of being. And, and the question that you ask is exactly the question that the highest being would ask. Am I, uh, am I being sufficiently responsible? Am I sufficiently caring for others and for the rest of nature? That's exactly the question that only persons can ask. Uh, and it's only possible because, in a sense, they're not simply a part. They're able to step outside of the whole. Uh, that's the only claim that we have to be higher than anything else, than, than the dog. Uh, the dog, yes, is probably uh, not going to think deeply about me and send me a Christmas card or do anything else, or you know, although he will give you a lick when you come home. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Put him on an unequal. I'm not sure. Yeah, how but we have the authority to do that, uh, and only by our apex or thinking with we are the highest, yeah. bring him yeah. back into yeah. being. Yeah, uh, a great question. Um, you know, in a sense, we would never even uh, ask that question, though, if we didn't think somehow the dog is almost as equal as we are. Well, That's the question. Of course, we can ask that in the theoretical state, yeah. as we expected yeah. to be yeah. in the yeah. auditorium. But if we are to do outside of the auditorium, Uh, insofar as you care, you are. I mean, that's exactly, your care is exactly that giving stature, yielding place, setting yourself aside for the sake of the other. Yeah. I realize oh, okay. <laughs> Um, yes, um, when, when, when you think and act, you think and act from the perspective of, you know, it's not just today, it's forever. What, what I'm doing remains forever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rick. Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah. Um, make sure I understand the talk, right? So the, the purpose of the project is to... Um, establish a kind of uh, status for human beings where they're not mere substance or mere stuff. Mm. So to sort yeah. of imbue yeah. them with the yeah. kind of dignity. Yeah. And we're doing that by defining the human being, therefore, as as a creature with inwardness, yeah. relationship, uh, relationship and mutuality. Yeah. Um, so what then would the status then be of, say, someone in a permanent, permanent vegetative state where, where none of these categories pertain to them and it's a permanent, so there's no sort of potential. And I ask this, of course, with uh, the sort of Canadian euthanasia laws in mind. So if, if a particular human being doesn't qualify under the categories that you're assigning to them, what then? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's obviously one of the questions that uh, 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 the, the whole issue of defining the person and so on struggles with, which I think is a mistaken conception. Um, to ask that question, you already have to have an other in mind. 
whether that other is able to communicate with you or do anything for you uh, except exist makes no difference. The fact that they are in being means that they are there and that you are relating to them. The relationship may be very minimal and very unsatisfactory and not, uh, 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 you know, it may not be the full realization of, of, of the communication that could occur, uh, but uh, one of the things that, uh, that characterizes persons is that they communicate even at that most minimal level. Uh, um, Helen Keller had, that, had exactly that problem until she learned language, that she was regarded as subhuman, you know. Uh, uh, it's a, 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 the fact that a person is not in, 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 in the mode of, of articulate communication doesn't mean that they're not available to you. Otherness is prior to all communication, and that's what defines them. Uh, and that's uh, even to the extent that we even uh, worry or raise that question, and raise and, and think, well, what's the point at which we should, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, withdraw life support or uh, food and water uh, or whatever? Uh, that's the question you would only ask, knowing that this is another. Uh, it's that it's that that issue. It's, now, yes, that is a boundary issue, a boundary question. Uh, when a person dies, we have no no problem. But we have a residual kind of relationship, even with the corpse. We don't just throw it out with the trash. It's even, there's even less there than when a person is in a, in a persistent vegetative state. Uh, and um, what I'm trying to do is find a way to, to uh, address exactly those questions that make sense uh, in terms of the lived experience uh, and in terms of uh, you know how how you know how does the law even deal with it? Um, the law has to say, well, let's go to the next of kin, which is a very revealing step. So the law says, no, no, if the person can speak for themselves, let's get someone who can speak for them. You know. So again, you're constantly everything we do constantly says yes. Uh, there's a relationship that's ongoing that we cannot say, no, it's, 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 it's over. There's nothing there. There's, there is otherness there. And that's enough. All right, I know we're probably, uh, we're, uh, this would have to One be more. the final, final question, um, because we have to keep on our schedule here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a thought, and I wonder if I'm on the right track, but the intensity or primacy of relationality helps one to overcome that I think you can see in a substance-based metaphysics of either a historicism on one hand or a history read as alienated other, you know, extruded facts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my first comment. And second, um, you're, you're setting up a paradoxical structure when you say that we're the center mm -hmm. because yeah. it's exactly the opposite yeah. of an egoism. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say the word is, is obedience, a kind of ontological obedience happening, a listening as obedience, um, a receptivity that, that sure. involves a, a twofold yeah. process? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are great observations, and I think uh, um, I would agree, you know, 100% with you that that's that's in essence what we're aiming at here is the idea that um, relation is only possible for persons who can set themselves aside. That's how relation occurs, and that's how we know the other by setting ourselves aside, putting ourselves in place of the other, or whatever we're studying. The scientist has to put himself aside to know reality. Uh, the friend has to think of, of, the, of, the friend, of the friend first. We have to think of the neighbor first, you know, all of that. Um, 
All right, I think uh, uh, our, uh, our maitre d' here, our, our MC, our, our uh, uh, chief, chief organizer, uh, some final words, Thomas? Oh, thank you. Thanks very much.